I've been riding the Trek Fuel EX 9.8 2019 model. A friend of mine owns this bike. He's done a few mods, so it comes 130, 130 travel. He's gone 140 in the Fox 34. It's just a Fox 34 performance. So it's got the grip. I think it's called Grip 3. Damper, pretty basic damper. And it's got faint clicks, so they're kind of faint clicks until you get the half. And then you've still got some faint kind of clicks all the way to full lockout. And it is, it's a full lockout, it's killer. The rear shock, pretty much full lockout as well. Standard as uh, the through shaft, so as you compress it, the there's a shaft internally that comes out of the bottom. So I don't know much about the through shaft, but to be honest, it doesn't feel, doesn't stand out to be more supple or, or more compliant or anything like that. It's just a rear shot. Uh, I ended up, it comes with a, comes standard with a 0.2 spacer. I experimented, I took the spacer out. Rode it for a fair bit with the spacer in, took the spacer out and got a better, more supple feeling. Was allowed, to, was able to run a little higher in the travel, uh, a little higher in the sag, so uh, just under 30%. 200 to 205 psi with without the 0.2 spacer in there it felt quite good it felt more compliant more supple still with plenty of speed uh, and and plenty to push against at that higher pressure so rear end feels good the fork luft cap 34 140 mil when i got it, it had one token he was running it in the mid 80s i think pressure felt like there was no support at the start it was, it was kind of like it, it. S sloppy at the start and then just a wall of progression pumped it up to get that good uh, efficient feeling off the top that I like and it was just too choppy so I dropped the pressure a bit ended up having to be deep in the sag again to get compliance so I took the token out it's got one to had one token in it ripped the token out up the pressure uh, played from 105 down to 97 97 was really really good I could probably even go 96, 95, wouldn't go any lower than 95. It starts to get a little little inefficient and a little a little sloppy. Still not going through the travel, so if you have a look. Yeehaw bars only at probably let's say six eighths, three quarters of the way, or probably more, it's probably seven eighths. So almost all the way through bottom out, but I never ever reach bottom out on the fork. I never felt bottom out on the rear either. Uh, talk a bit more about the rear in a minute. But the fork, the loof cap, these Fox forks and rear shocks, since I've done started doing these Evol air cans and, and air springs, they're, what I've noticed with a couple of different Fox rear shocks with the Evol, outside of the X2, the DPX2, this one, they have quite a large negative air chamber now in relation to how big the positive chamber is. So you really don't need to run all the tokens that we used to run. You can, and, and it will help with progression, but I don't think it aids in the quality of ride. I think going too many tokens, especially with these larger negative air chambers now, you're losing, you're losing compliance. You're losing that supple feeling. Uh, and I think you're going in the wrong direction by, by loading these ones up with tokens. So. Taking the tokens out and going more pressure seems to be the way to go. With, yeah, within reason. Within reason. There's obviously different suspension designs and whatnot that will uh, they'll need more a more progressive setup within the shop. So uh, yeah, a little bit of a ramble about that. But anyway, fork felt good with no token. I'd I'd like to feel how the 34 feels without the luft cap in it. I had an issue with the luft cap in my fork. The Fox 36, the NA2 spring, the newest Evo. Uh, it made the negative air chamber too big, and I've had to go all spaces out uh, in the positive chamber to find to get closer to supple. And I ended up taking the luft cap back out of my fork. So on this, it's bearable. It's it's good. It's it's nice. It's it's supportive, reasonably supple. Not excellent. Not I wouldn't say they're excellent, but they are good. So fork I'm happy with, rear shock I'm happy with for a 130 travel bike. Bars, so he's got a carbon chromag BZA 
bar. So they're at 770 mil wide. I don't know if they're a little bit stiff. They do have compliance. I think maybe they're a little bit stiff, but not bad. Eight degree back sweep, five degree up sweep. Uh, the Renful I'm used to, seven degree back, five degree up, so similar. I found I was not finding the sweet spot of cornering. I wasn't finding I had all the control that I wanted in cornering. And I think maybe that's just the sweep difference. So it's the, the eight degrees versus the seven degrees. I haven't put my head, put my finger on it yet. I don't know what was going on there. But yeah, don't know. The bars are okay, but I wouldn't buy, to me, I would definitely not buy carbon bars. I don't think there's a benefit outside of weight at all. But yeah, he's built this thing nice and light. It's a carbon frame, it's a carbon bar. Plastic pedals, the Bontragers. I've just done a review on the Bontragers, so check that out. It's got carbon seat stay, aluminium chain stay, GX165 cranks, GX Eagle drivetrain, the GX cassette. I've found the NX cassettes are actually pretty, they're, they're quite a step down from the GX cassette. I'll talk more about that in another video. SLX brakes and he's upgraded to the Ice Tech rotor at the front. Still not quite enough power if you want to be going fast and hard, which I did go pretty fast and uh, reasonably hard on this bike. Once I got it set up, it felt really, really good. Carbon wheels. So we got Bontrager Line Pro 30, carbon front and rear. <coughs> not as stiff as other carbon wheels I've ridden on. Still felt good. They felt alright, for sure. 2.3 aggressor climbs really really well it's a little bit limited on the descents but not really not it's not it's a good tire the aggressor is a good tire definitely much preferred in the 2.5 than the 2.3 but even in this 2.3 double down it was strong as hell i didn't yeah i didn't cut it or anything like that which is good uh i was riding kind of choppy stuff and yeah there was a chance for some pinch flats there so hung in there the wheels didn't break not too sure about the durability of these Bontrager carbon wheels. He has broken one before, as far as I know. But Bontrager, wicked warranty. Killer warranty. When I had my track, killer warranty. No problems whatsoever. <coughs> How does this bike ride? Came in the high setting. So I did some laps on the high setting. A little bit of fiddling with the suspension. Get it, get it feeling nice. Get the bar roll nice. Get the brakes. The, all the levers. You know, all the cockpit set up perfect. And it felt like it needed more. If you see my helmet cam run that I did on this, I spoke about dropping it down and and, uh, and it definitely was better. It most certainly was much, much better. More confidence and it sits, it, it, it's more stable. The bike's more stable with the uh, in the low position than it is in the high position. The high position, it feels more, mm, I'm gonna try and demonstrate how I feel, high versus low. On the high, I feel like this, on the low I feel like this. So, if that makes any sense, or you're having a laugh, whatever. Uh, being here when you're riding is much more confidence inspiring than being here. So, and that's what it gave me. It wasn't a huge, you know, that's a, an elongated uh, representation of what it is, but it's more or less what it is. So, he was running the smooth lube as well, which was pretty, uh, pretty good, very efficient. The drivetrain runs efficiently. These hubs, the hubs are killer. Anyway, back to how it rides. In the low, once I got it in the low setting, I then started really kind of fine tuning the suspension. I found with these clicks on the, on the grip damper, the grip three, which is just open, middle and lock, there is subtle changes between completely open and halfway towards the middle position. There's definitely a difference, but it's only subtle. And you'll only really notice that difference once you've got your spring rate dialed in. So that was good. I rode Twisted Gum, I rode Ewok, I rode Nice and Narrow, Bullet Track, all the four course meal up at Waterfall Gully. So I stayed at Waterfall Gully, I did a heap of repeats, uh, a few different days. Uh, I did Working for the Doll as well, which is a fast, flowy, single track. This thing carries wicked speed on the fast, flowy stuff. It's good to pump off. Being a 130 travel, you're not gonna lose yourself in that in that travel. So uh, really good to kind of flick around and throw around. Wheelie, I could wheelie this thing for kilometers. Literally, I could, I could wheelie it forever. I could wheelie it into retirement. It was a really, really easy bike to ride. Jump on, shred, straight away. Once I got in that low position, just, just shred. Relatively quiet, 
A little bit of cable rattle. Can't really hear it, but partially is this. Partially it's just cables at the front, which you know you can you can put clips there. There's there's plenty of different stuff you can do there. But in the frame as well, if you don't keep these taut, these lines taut, it does rattle. So not huge on that. Carbon versus alloy, I've touched on it before. I've, I've definitely got to make a carbon versus alloy video. So just addressing that. It's lighter. It may be, it may be a little stiffer. I don't know. I'm not sure. I, I, it, it's not stiffer enough for me to go, oh, carbon's heaps stiffer. But it's, it's a little more direct. And I guess there's less cushion between the hits and you outside of you just your suspension and your tires. So there's no cushion in the frame. Alloy bikes, I feel like maybe there's a bit more of a do do do, like more of a thud, where these are more of a ting. Uh, I won't get into the sound effects because you know, I know how much you guys love when I rattle on some sound effects. Uh, but anyway, yeah, carbon versus alloy. I'd prefer an alloy bike, uh, cheaper. To me, a little bit more durable. I don't know. That's just my feelings. These grips, super cas. Uh, I, I kind of touched on them briefly. They're cheap grips, but they felt killer the whole time. They're good, good ride. Seat tube angle is kind of a hot topic at the moment. Climbing on this thing was a dream. It's three kilos lighter than my bike. So I think this comes in at about 13 kilos. <coughs> so definitely light, definitely efficient up the climbs. But I don't think it's like awesome pedaling platform efficient. I think it's just efficient because it's light and it's short travel. So it's not, it doesn't stand out from the crowd as an efficient climber, but it was much easier to climb than my 16 kilo 170, 160 trail bike. So uh, loved climbing on it, loved descending on it. If I was to compare this with the intense primer that I rode, the bandit that I rode not that long ago, Quite close. The Bandit had much better wheels. The Bandit had the Crank Brothers Synthesis wheels. Both 29ers. Uh, and I'll speak about the 29er thing in a minute as well. But comparing the two, very, very similar. This climbs a little bit more comfortably. It feels like it's got a more comfortable climbing position. I don't know the exact, this is a 74 degree effective. It might be 74 and a half. I should double check that. Uh, effective seat tube angle and I think the primer was around the 72 mark so they were similar this just felt a little bit easier to climb and I think partially because this is a bit smaller it feels like a, the right size bike for me I didn't feel stretched out on it 150 drop of post putting the post in and out of the in and out of it you've got to kind of lean forward as you push down because of the because of the slack angle it puts a lot of backwards load on the on the seat and okay it will potentially do damage so not a big fan of the seat tube angle, but still climbed well. I could you know, motor up the hill, no worries. Carried wicked speed, but not very stable at the front end. So not a superbly stable bike at the front for descending. Now, if you're, a, if you're like me and you love to descend, you're not gonna buy a bike like this because it's just not enough travel. It's simply not enough travel. Even though it's, a lot of people say that a 29er is the equivalent to an extra 10 mil travel or or whatever they say. Some people say it's 20, but it seems like the general consensus is 2.9er equals 10 mil more travel. It feels like it's 10 mil more travel, so you can go a bike that's 10 mil less than what you would have with a 27.5, which I don't believe. I think your travel is your travel, and you're set up to suit, you know, more travel means you can create more suppleness within your, uh, no, nah, retract that, so it, it, it's, it's more deep and complex than that. But you wouldn't buy this bike if you were a descender, but if you like to party, you, know, you like to go down a lot of uh, flow trails, technical trails, but your rides are super long and you want you, know, you want a cross country bike that can slay. This is it, this and the Primer are both slayers. I felt with this being a 29er, this is one of the only 29ers I've ridden. It's this and Andy Clark's Hightower LT are the only 29ers I've ridden that haven't given me 29er back end. So when I say 29er back end, it's that, that oh, that's that feeling of the, it just feels like the back wheel doesn't take a hit very well. That you now they say they roll over things better and blah blah blah, but the the hits that they don't roll over, 
that they take, it feels like they take those hits so much harder than a 20, well not so much harder, but noticeably harder than a 27.5 back end. This bike didn't do it. This bike felt balanced. It felt right. It felt like the right size for me. It felt like it was built correctly. Uh, like I said, taking that shock out was perfect. Made the bike feel really, really good. I used the travel regularly, all the travel regularly, but I never felt the bottom of the of the back end. So taking that spacer out made it feel heaps smooth. Not heaps smoother, but noticeably smoother. More compliant and more fun, more confidence inspiring. I rode it on Twisted Gum, 426 I did yesterday, or the day before yesterday, down Twisted Gum, which is a pretty technical trail here in Adelaide. Uh, it's got good, real tight uh, descending sections with a couple of pinch climbs in it, and a lot of technical stuff. So this thing slayed, it had no problems. Like I said, I had a little bit of trouble steering it to, it's like I was just lagging with steering a little bit. So I don't know if it was bars, a combination of everything. I've got a 50 mil stem on here as well. So it comes with a 60. He's already done the 50 mil conversion. It's killer. It's just a Bontrager stem, so straight on. Works with the knock block, no, no hassles there. The SLX brakes, touched on it briefly before. They're good, not great. The back end was fading a little bit, so that needs a bleed. Bleed that, it'll feel killer again. But uh, ice tech rotor on the front, 200. Not quite the power I'd want for the way I'd ride this bike, but I think if you were to ride this bike, the way I'm riding it, and this isn't having to go up the bike, it's just, it's built as light as possible for that for that 130 mil travel uh, market. If I descended this how I ride all the time, I'd, I'd be scared I'd break it, to be honest. I don't think it's tough enough, I don't think it's strong enough. Uh, it's good that it's got an alloy chainstay, but I really don't think it would handle real abuse. And saying that, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't anyway, it shouldn't be made to handle trails that you should be riding on a 160mm travel bike. So, definitely punches at its weight, not above its weight, definitely punches at its weight. Easy to descend on, easy to ride, easy to climb, very intuitive bike, love how easy, tre every trek I've ridden, it's get on and oh yeah. They make a bike to suit you. They make a bike to absolutely suit you, and it's killer. I really love what Trek do with their bikes. Don't like their proprietary rubbish with their rear shocks and their uh, individual sizing. I've had no, countless issues with the uh, shortened stroke, with the remedy and whatnot, with the shock rattling. Doesn't do any real harm, but the rattling is annoying as hell, so I don't like that. But they just make a killer feeling bike, and they always slay. So. Super happy with the bike. Super happy that I got to ride it. Thanks, Dave. I'm going to try and get on a 2020 Trek Fuel EX, which is pretty much this. It's 140 at the front, but with a 36. So that'll be good to be able to ride a 36 non look cap in a 140 mil travel. Uh, not sure about wheels on that one, but yeah. This was a lot of fun. I slapped heaps of laps on it. And uh, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't buy a short travel bike myself. I think that more travel is almost always more fun. So short travel, a little bit easier to get around, a little bit, if you're a little weaker in the legs or, or not really into the descending, definitely don't go a long travel bike. If you're not happy, you know, if you're not confident descending or you're not just not into that, stick with a short travel bike for sure. But if your priority is descending, you need something longer travel. You need something longer travel and slack a head angle. This is a 67, it'd be just shy of 60, it's probably 66.7 or 66.8 now with the extra 10 mil of travel, but it's not enough. Descending, I think you need a minimum of maybe 140 and 150 if it's a 29er, um, or any, either or really. I was gonna say 150 and 150 with a 27.5, but I don't think it matters. Uh, that's pretty much contradicting what I said before about the, the 10 mil, tra you know, the wheels equal 10 mil of extra travel. I don't know, maybe subconsciously they do. Who knows, I'd have to kind of nut it out a little bit first. but. Uh, I think if you want to descend hard, 65 to maybe 66 degree head angle at the steepest. Uh, 150 travel at the front minimum, and let's go 150 at the back. 140 to 150 at the back. Yeah, so I guess I'm babbling a little bit, but overall, happy with it. I don't like carbon bikes. I don't like 29ers. This thing was killer. 29er didn't feel out of whack, and the carbon didn't feel terrible. But 
like I said, I'm not I'm not convinced on durability. Big rock strikes, like you've got a good rubber protector here, but I don't know. I don't know. I've seen a lot of broken carbon bikes. I've seen a lot of broken alloy bikes, but I'm not sold on it. So thanks a lot, Dave. Killer bike. Get into wherever they sell treks. You know, in Adelaide here, you got Bicycle Express, Bicycle Fix Woodside. You got a few different stores that, that stock them. Get in, try and demo one. Try and demo one. You might find a deal on a 2019 model going cheap. Now that the 2020s are out, you might love the 2020. Who knows? Get in your local shop, demo a bike, suss them out. It's so much easier to buy a bike when you've ridden it and you know what you're in for. Instead of just being obsessed with what, a, you know, what it looks like, the colour, whatever that is. Demo your bikes before you before you buy them when possible.